I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A California mother of two vanishes on a run. Just bring her home. Bring her home safe. The latest in a string of missing jogger cases haunting the country. It makes you think that, like, it could be anybody. Today, a Crime Watch Daily investigation running into danger. Then, it's one of the most notorious cases of all time involving sex, jealousy, and murder. She went nuts. She kept yelling, killer, killer, killer. Diane Zamora and her high school sweetheart convicted of killing her love rival in what came to be known as the Texas Cadet Murder. Now, in her first interview in nearly a decade. Did you harm Adrian in any way? Zamora speaks out from behind bars to our Michelle Sagona. Did you pull the trigger? No. And she's offering up a new motive for the crime. I think he did this because but is she telling the truth? We bring in the human lie detector. Do you believe Diane was lying to me in her interview? Plus, he's the Utah frat boy these women call the devil in disguise. I was scared. I was scared of him. Now, it's sentencing day for the serial rapist, and his victims are outraged. I definitely don't feel Jason Marie Lopez got what he deserved. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Mattel with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Watch Daily from here on the streets of New York City. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, jealousy. It can be a powerful emotion. And in the case of former Naval Academy cadet Diane Zamora, it can be a reason to kill. Michelle Sagona has a big exclusive on the story that made headlines around the world. Chris dubbed the cadet killers. Zamora and her boyfriend are both convicted of killing her love rival. Now, after about a decade of silence, she's willing to tell her side of the story and she gives brand new details of what she believes happened on that fateful night. Young. I was a dumb kid. I was a dumb teenager. In love. I said a lot of things because I loved him. And deadly. She said that the girl, everyone knew that the girl was a tramp and a slut and that she deserved to die. She said, David Graham, killer, killer. Convicted murderer Diane Zamora confessed to killing 16-year-old Adrian Jones, whom she believed to be her romantic rival in a love triangle with then-boyfriend David Graham. I was 17 when this happened, and it's just, it's crazy how different things are. Very different, but where did it all go so wrong? I was the good child. <laughs> I, was, I was the one that was supposed to go places. Um, I never got in any kind of trouble. Never had any problems at school, anything. Once on the fast track to a successful military career, to life behind bars. But now, Diane wants to set the record straight in this exclusive only with Crime Watch Daily. And she claims this will be the first time she's told her real side of the story. In her first interview in nearly a decade, Diane's offering up explosive new information about that murderous night. I know I made bad decisions. A lot of bad decisions, a lot of bad judgments. Beginning early December 1995, when after only two months of dating, a then 18-year-old David Graham makes a salacious confession to his 17-year-old girlfriend, Diane Zamora. That he had been unfaithful to her. Local news reporter Ron Zimmerman covered the story. David no doubt met Adrian on the high school cross country team. They ended up in, in a car going home together and instead of going straight home, uh, David uh, took Adrian behind an, an elementary school and apparently some clothes came off. 16-year-old Adrian Jones was a beautiful blonde track student at Mansfield High School in Grand Prairie, Texas. Adrian uh, was an extremely good looking girl, very, very pretty, blonde hair, hazel eyes. Uh, she was the kind of girl that would simply stop a young man's vision right there and his eyes simply couldn't leave her. And when David tells Diane he had sex with Adrian? She went nuts. Uh, she banged her head against the floor and she kept yelling, kill her, kill her, kill her. And? And David agreed to kill Adrian. 
Next, a murder plot takes shape as detailed in the couple's written confession to cops. Diane writes the plan was for David to break her neck and sink her body to the bottom of Joe Pool Lake. And in David's confession, he writes, the only thing that could satisfy her womanly vengeance was the life of the one that had, for an instant, taken her place. It was a life-changing event for all three of them, Diane, Adrian, and David. According to her own testimony, around 1 a.m., David picks up Adrian, Diane's hiding in the trunk. David drives to a remote area where Diane surprises Adrian from the back seat. The attack is on. According to David and Diane's confessions to police, Adrian is beaten in the head with weights and the butt of David's gun. But somehow she escapes the car and runs into a field where she collapses. Then horrifying final moments as her one-time lover shoots her twice in the head at point-blank range. A farmer driving down a desolate road saw something beside the road and it was Adrian's body. Sadly, who killed Adrian will remain a mystery as her parents grieve and wonder what happened. It was extremely frustrating. You know, you want to know what happened and nobody is, is talking to you, nobody's answering your questions. Texas Rangers were called into the case and there were police from two different jurisdictions looking at it, but they simply didn't have a whole lot to go on at, at all. So it was a real mystery to the police. After that, Diane Zamora left Texas behind for the hollowed halls of the Naval Academy. And it appears Diane and David have gotten away with murder. Nearly a year has passed and the teenage killers are adults and successful military cadets. David Graham at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And Diane Zamora at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Their killer secret was safe until... Diane let the word out to her roommates that in fact she had killed somebody. It was a bombshell admission. The conversation went something like this. It looks like you and David over at the Air Force Academy really love each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, we really do. Would you do anything for each other? Oh, yeah. Would you kill for David? Yes, and I already have. Once word gets out, Diane and David are arrested and charged with the murder of Adrian Jones and flown back to Texas to stand trial. And the prosecution comes out swinging, calling to the stand several people who Diane confessed to. Shoot her, kill her, shoot her. And Diane Zamora was told you that she was saying this to David Graham? Yes. She said that the girl, everyone knew that the girl was a tramp and a slut and that she deserved to die. Diane said that Adrian deserved to die because she had taken something of hers that she knew belonged to someone else. And then there were Diane's own words. I screamed at him, kill her killer. He was just so scared that he wasn't about to say no to me. It was all in the confession. In separate trials, the former teen flames are convicted of capital murder. We the jury find the defendant Diane Michelle Zamora guilty of the offense of capital murder. The punishment is hereby set at life in prison. But now in her first interview in a decade, convicted killer Diane Zamora, who has spent the majority of her life behind bars, is speaking out. When the jury or the judge came back and said, you're sentenced to life in prison, what was that moment like for you? I don't even really remember it. Um, it's a blur. It really is. Um, I think after they said guilty, that was probably the last thing I heard. Diane claims she's not a cold-blooded killer. In fact, she now says she played no real physical role in Adrian's death. Did you pull the trigger? No. Did you harm Adrian in any way? The only thing I did was pull her hair. I remember at one time they were, they were fighting. But what about her confessions to four different people and her handwritten confession to cops? I had no physical part in this, even though they tried to prove I did at first. And even though I said I did in that stupid confession, um, I had no physical part in it, and they proved that in court. But while prosecutors couldn't prove she played a physical role in the murder, they did prove Diane was the mastermind behind the killing when she allegedly told David to kill Adrian. True? Did you ever ask David to kill her? No, but I did wish her dead at one point, and I think that it went from there. Um, but of course, I wished him dead. I wished myself dead. Um, but I didn't, I didn't believe anything like that would or could happen. And then when it did, um, 
I was in denial. And what does she have to say about the love triangle that led to this deadly confrontation? Diane says there wasn't one. That's right, she claims the motive for the killing wasn't sex, it was violence. I think he did this because he was obsessed with guns. Um, I think he wanted to know what it was like to use them on someone. So if someone were to say, you were the foundation behind this. No, I think I was a good excuse. I really think now that's what I was. I was a good excuse to do something he already wanted to do. These are stunning accusations from Diane and a very different take from this convicted killer's initial confessions to police and court testimony. But how do we know if she's telling the truth now or if she's simply a master manipulator? We're inside the head of this subject. We are. Up next, Crime Watch Daily is looking for answers and brings in an interrogation specialist to analyze our interview with Diane Zamora. There's the seed right there. Then the million dollar question. Do you believe Diane was lying to me in her interview? Police say Naval Academy cadet Diane Zamora helped mastermind the killing of a love rival alongside her then boyfriend. However, she tells a totally different story to our Michelle Sagona from behind bars. So what's the truth? We brought in a man who is essentially a human lie detector to watch Zamora's interview and tell us what he thinks. In her first interview in nearly a decade, convicted killer Diane Zamora is finally sharing what she says is the real story of what happened the night she and her boyfriend, David Graham, killed 16-year-old Adrian Jones. At this point, you've spent more time behind bars than you have in the outside world. What is that like for you? It's strange. Um, it's something, you know, um, I talk about a lot with a lot of people because uh, I was, I was so young, I, I had no experiences out there. But we wanted to know if Diane was telling us the truth or simply a master manipulator, as prosecutors claimed 20 years ago. We, the jury, find the defendant, Diane Michelle Zamora, guilty of the offense of capital murder. The punishment is hereby set at life in prison. Analyzing Diane's every word is interview and interrogation specialist Stan Walters. With over 35 years experience, they don't call him the lie guy for nothing. And Stan isn't necessarily listening to what a suspect says, but what he or she doesn't say. So one of the things I do when I watch your interviews, I try not to look, not to look at the case facts. I want to see what you glean from the subject. Can I envision and see the events in my head? as it occurs. If there's something missing, that, that stands out more to me. She's leaving, somebody leaving in a block of time, a conversation, a connection. Now it's time to put those skills to use on Diane's interview. Let's play it. I can't even tell you what was going through my mind except that I was just so young and stupid. I was like, yeah, I wanna meet this girl. You don't, you don't think things through. You don't think, oh, it's really late at night. That's when bad things happen. Right away, Stan starts noticing little inconsistencies, especially when Diane talks about playing no physical role in the murder. I feel like that option should always be open for the jury. They should be able to decide what your sentence is because I had no physical part in this. There's a surgical denial, and that's when you said you jumped that too, you caught that. Right physical part. Well, tell me about the planning part. Tell me about the conversation you and David had. How long before that night had you talked about it? Day, two days, three days? Had this been planned? Had it been running in your mind? Diane initially confessed to hitting Adrian in the head with a weight. At her trial, she was asked if she witnessed David bashing Adrian's skull with the butt of his gun. And during my interview with her, she gave much of the same answer she gave the court. Did you see that happen? No, but I saw his elbow come down. I didn't have my contacts in. Oh, I didn't have contacts or glasses at all. But my you were hiding in the back of the car that night, your parents' Mazda, correct? True, um, but... Right there. But... But... Think of the butt as a giant eraser. What I've just said, you may not believe this, but... Erased everything, says you're not gonna believe it. Everything she just said, she just neutralized with that one but. 
and stands not done with this area of our interview. He refers to it as a hot moment, taking special note of Diane's familiar physical and verbal reenactment of the violent blow. The piece about David striking Adrian, that same action, even where she raised her arm in your interview, it's, it's, it's the exact same wording. To me, it sounds like it's a rehearsed segment. And that's key to her whole defense about the blow to the head. A defense Diane was sticking to throughout our interview. What was your role in all of this? Were you there? Did you participate? You were there. I didn't hit her in the head with a weight. Did you see that happen? She didn't get hit in the head with a weight. Um, she got hit in the head with the butt of David's gun. Stan believes that Diane's initial confession to cops about hitting Adrian with a weight is the truth and most consistent with Adrian's injuries. I'm not a forensic pathologist, but the butt of a gun's not gonna do that with one stroke. Her face caved in, her skull caved in. This part of the brain, if you remember several of studies and watching homicide courses, this is a very, very thick, thick part of the skull. And it takes a tremendous amount of force compared to the other part of the skull, as thick as here. For that to be caved in, that's a lot of power. But what about other details of that night? Smells, sights, and sounds. Did she cry for help? I didn't hear her. Um, I'm sure she did, but I didn't hear her. How are you sure? What makes you think she was sure? And then I would be a great point with the limited time you have to see what would happen if we pursue that spot or circle back to it oh, as the interrogator. Here's the truth, here's the story. And when it doesn't quite work and doesn't match up, the brain says, we gotta straighten out this incongruence. And that's where the modifications keep coming in that you're hearing. And then there's this revealing exchange. Did you ever ask David to kill her? No, but I did wish her dead at one point, And I think that it went from there. From there? That just jumped out at me. It, I wished her dead at one point. It went from there. There's the plan. There's the plan. There's the seed right there. I wished her dead at one point. She probably... And it proceeded from there. Maybe told David, and that's where it stemmed from. That's where the seed was planted. We're inside the head of this subject. We are. And while Stan discovers several inconsistencies and omissions, it's now the moment we've been waiting for. Do you believe Diane was lying to me in her interview? She was being evasive by not letting you get close enough. It's easier to be evasive than flat out deceptive because denial, deception is either black, white, zero, one, plus, minus. Her emotional manipulation lets you, leaves a lot of uncharted area, unstated boundaries to float around in. No one will ever really know what happened that night except for the three teenagers who took a ride on a dark Texas road to have their lives forever veered off course. When are you eligible to get out of prison? Uh, as of right now, it would be 40 flat years, so it wouldn't even be for 20 more years. So if you still have another 20. And that is it's not a guarantee. No. They could leave me in forever. Along with fighting to get her story out there, Zamora has joined another battle, adding her name to the list of people who would like to see juvenile justice reform and get rid of mandatory sentences like the one she received. Right now, she's not eligible for parole until 2036, and we want to hear from you on this. Do you believe Diane Zamora's story of what happened to Adrian Jones? Sound off right now on our Facebook page. Coming up, a father and his two boys on the way to football practice until a bomb blast stops them in their tracks. At that point, I just started to scream, get out of the car, get out of the car, get out of the car. Who would want to take out the family? The investigation leads Crime Watch Daily down a dark path. That's next. Flames engulf the road. A thick black cloud of smoke billows into the sky. But this is no ordinary car fire in Michigan. The vehicle, being driven by a respected lawyer, was just the target of a calculated and potentially deadly crime. Our Andrea Isom investigates. How could anyone escape this fireball of death? Okay, we have a bad accident. My car blew up with two kids. Plumes of toxic black smoke and flames lick the September sky. I've got two significant leg injuries that are chewed up pretty good, okay? A terrified father begs for help. Eight tissue wounds. They are bleeding. I need someone here now. 
Is it an accident or an explosion fueled by evil? There was a hole and you could see the starburst pattern. What it reminded me of was pictures of what the IEDs look like, you know, Iraq, Middle East, etc. But Eric Chappell wasn't driving in a war zone. He was driving his sons Grant and Cole to afternoon football practice in their sleepy hometown of Monroe, Michigan. I just remember uh, laying on the side of the road, watching the car burn, watching the gas tank explode, just laying down there, looking at my dad and my brother. Those moments were like what for you? Out of this world. Cole's older brother Grant still replays the whore. I see stars just completely disoriented. It was like a flash grenade or something. I can't really process what's going on because I just keep on like telling myself I'm gonna wake up at football practice. It's just like a bad dream. I must like have taken a nap during the car ride or something. The powerful blast rocketed their sturdy Volvo station wagon like a Formula One race car down the highway and then burst into flames. The hero dad had to act fast to save his kids from being burned alive. They were screaming, you know, they were in a lot of pain. And at that point, I just started to scream at the boys to, you know, get out of the car, get out of the car, and get out of the car. Grant and Cole crawl to the side of the road. All that remains of the family station wagon is a steel skeleton. I know my dad had carried me to the side of the road because I couldn't walk. They made a tourniquet out of my football belt to stop the bleeding. I remember seeing the blood. Cole's leg was, was pretty well chewed up. How close did you and your family, you and your boys, come to dying? Milliseconds. A shaken Eric phones his wife, Maureen Terrell, who was at another sporting event with the couple's two other kids, Erica and Emma. As a parent, you want to be there when your children are hurt. Maureen rushed to the hospital. Eric and the boys had cheated death all right, but their injuries were severe. Grant, who was the front seat passenger, had deep wounds to his buttocks. And Cole, who was sitting in the back passenger seat, had his left leg embedded with shrapnel. Eric suffered deep gashes in his arm and face. So you've got kids in multiple rooms, so you're running from room to room, and who's going into surgery first? Investigators comb the car for clues. Then they bring in a bomb-sniffing dog, and bam! The dog sniffs out a shocker. A homemade bomb had actually been planted under the car. Your first reaction, your first thought? A bomb. Like, what do you, what do you mean a bomb? A bomb so powerful, the blast could be heard a mile away. And cops say it was intended not just to maim, but to kill. All right, so this is what? This is what... The the size, the length, the, the width, everything we think is actual pipe, not the actual, but a cut uh, detail of what was used. The mad bomber had stuffed the metal pipe with ball bearings, as well as ammo for maximum damage. So this goes all the way, this, this goes through, piece here goes all the way through. Goes through, smoke this powder inside along with the shrapnel. And this is how the bomb was triggered using this toy car's remote control. Remote control vehicles like this. What we think is they use these cars, okay. or parts from these trucks. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we think they use. Cops believe the trigger man may have been tailing Chapel's car when the bomb was detonated. Thankfully, the Volvo had a sunroof, and experts believe that was the difference between life and death. Having a sunroof made all the difference in the world. Why? Uh, because it vented the explosion. They, you know, they, they indicated to us that had we not uh, had a sunroof, we wouldn't be here today would do this? I said, I cannot think of anyone that would have that evilness inside them to hurt children. Uh, I think the target was me, but I, I have no doubt that the person who detonated the bomb knew the boys were in the car. Eric Chappell prides himself as a good lawyer, but he's made some enemies along the way. His practice has handled some bitter divorce cases, one that actually involved accusations of a husband videotaping his stepdaughters and their friends in tanning beds. Eric represented the now ex-wife. The device was pointed right at the tanning beds. I think that's when she finally said, enough. That man, Eric calls a bitter ex, has never been charged or listed as a suspect in connection with the car bombing. In fact, no one has. Despite that, Eric says he's sure he knows who did it, and he's ready to name names. The guy's a monster. Eric believes that monster is still taunting him and his family. 
On an anniversary of the car bombing, Chapel's daughters Erica and Emma became targets of a second bomb. I walked with her to the mailbox. As soon as she pulled it out, you see it rolling. You have a basic idea of what explosives look like, but when I looked at it closer, you could see the words. They claim some sicko planted it in their mailbox, the word explosive written across it. She dropped it. I made sure she was on the other side of the road. I called my dad within like 10 minutes. Fire trucks, police, ambulance, bomb squad, everybody was there. Thankfully, this one was unarmed. What I understand it was, was a commercial explosive device. It wasn't armed, you know, it didn't have a detonator on it, no fuse or what have you, but someone had placed that in the mailbox. No one has ever been charged for planting the unarmed bomb either. The Chapel girls were shaken, but they want the person who tried to mail them a piece of hell to know they're survivors too. I say, look how strong and amazing our family has grown. There is nothing you can do that would ever change that. We're stronger, we're better than yesterday, better when that happened. We've learned from our mistakes, we're living life now. We're not afraid. Shockingly, in the five years since the car bomb explosion changed the course of the chapel's lives forever, the feds still don't have a prime suspect. Well, sadness comes to mind because we have not been able to solve it. Even though Eric says he knows who did this, cops aren't naming a suspect, and neither can we. In fact, ATF Special Agent Dawkins admits the case is running out of gas. I was very confident that we would be able to solve that, um, this incident, within a couple of months, within a couple of weeks. We've not been able to do it, obviously, and it's very frustrating for us. And he's reaching out to the public for help. We need a video, we need someone talking, we need that one shred that could connect. Hey, we thought it was that person. Now we have the link to it. Right now, we don't have the link. Cole and Grant were badly injured in the blast, but they're back on their feet and back to playing sports. I would just want them to see me and my family, see that we're still here. Still strong and still standing. Yeah. And Grant has turned the ordeal into something else positive. He's going to medical school to be a trauma surgeon. You know what they say about terrorist attacks, like you can't let this change the way we live. Say nice try, we're still all here. But mom Maureen says she'll always be looking over her shoulder. I lived in this perfect little bubble and everybody loved each other and life was grand and no one would ever hurt anyone. This is your new normal? Yes. I think he's a despicable person. I don't think that he has much use walking this earth. It's one thing to focus on me, but the type of person who would do something to hurt kids, you know, they, they don't have a place in our society. The ATF is offering up to a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for the car bomb. If you know anything, you can call 1-888-ATF-BOMB. Up next, New York, Michigan, California. Three states, three joggers either killed or missing. I'm coming, honey. I'm trying. I'm doing everything I can. And uh, I love you. Are these simply random acts of evil, or is something else going on here? What's it going to take to solve this case? Hardcore detective work. Our all-new investigation into the escalating problem is next. It seems like every day we're seeing another story of a jogger being attacked. Of course, here in New York, we have the tragic unsolved case of Karina Vetrano, murdered while running through a Queens Park. Police are still actively looking for a killer. And today, our Reed Grinsell has another sad story of a woman attacked while out for a jog. Is it open season on female runners? It seems like a nationwide epidemic. One by one, joggers killed or kidnapped in the middle of a run. The most recent case in Redding, California. Sherry Papini was last seen jogging in her neighborhood near the foothills of Mount Shasta. If she was listening, I wanted to say that I, we're trying and um, uh, we're trying the best we can and I'm so sorry that I'm not there. That's Sherry's distraught husband, Keith, speaking to our Redding affiliate, KRCR. Sherry vanished into thin air in broad daylight her family believes she was kidnapped. Normal days, I would open the door and my family comes and runs and gives me a hug. Sherry wasn't home to give Keith that hug. 
He frantically searched the house. Their children were still at daycare. Keith found Sherry's cell phone down the street. Her pink jogging jacket was spotted nearby. That's when I knew she had been, in my opinion, taken or abducted. It's the worst thing in the world. I'm coming, honey. I'm trying. I'm doing everything I can. And uh, I love you. Just months ago in Rose Township, Michigan, outside Detroit, another mystery deep in the woods. Hi, we're going. What is the address of your emergency? There's a girl laying in my yard who just got shot a couple times. That's the dramatic 911 call after an unidentified man found a runner dead in his yard, murdered by an unknown assailant. Okay, she got shot? Yes. Laying face down, she's bleeding all over the place. I gotta get out there and see if I can help her. I think she got out of a car and somebody shot her. It was Alexandra Bruger. Her friends call her Allie. She was a nurse. Allie was on her daily 10 mile run in this wooded area when she was gunned down. It's really um, inconceivable for us to uh, even imagine what, what she went through at the, those last moments. Nikki Bruger put her daughter's pink jogging shoes out in her memory for a young woman who was well-liked and had no enemies. She was only four foot nine, 98 pounds, and she looked like a child when she ran. Even though she was 31, she looked very young. Allie's mother says she put up a brave fight against her killer. She pushed down her fear at that time. She could have stood there frozen in fear, but she pushed down her fear and turned to run. And this person shot her four times in the back while she was running away. The Michigan State Police were called in to investigate Allie's murder. You look at the family, you look at the boyfriend, you look at any other boyfriend, you look at any past criminals, you look at sex offenders, you look at, and these are all things that we're either already have finished doing or in the process of doing now. The killer is still on the loose, leaving the small town in fear. We leave our keys in our cars. We don't lock our doors. Uh, the barns are open. We just haven't, we've changed. We've locked down, keeping our eyes open, and it's kind of scary. I've been in Rose Township 17 years, and we've never had anything like this before, and it's, we're all afraid. And not to get too much information is even scarier. And in Princeton, Massachusetts, west of Boston, cops have checked out almost 1,000 tips in the killing of Vanessa Marcotte. And it makes you think that, like, it could be anybody in it. Like, should you trust anybody? Vanessa lived in New York City and worked for Google. She was visiting her mom and went out for a Sunday afternoon run. She never returned. Cops found her body a half mile from her mother's home, naked and burned. In the case that continues to haunt New York City, Karina Vetrano killed during a jog in a park in Queens. There are no new developments. What's it going to take to solve this case? Hardcore detective work. Karina's murder has New York City on edge. The NYPD's chief of detectives, Robert Boyce, is working tirelessly to solve the killing. The motive was sexual assault, and this was a random attack. We are confident, but we're not closing out anything on this case. Is there one assailant, bloodthirsty, traveling from state to state, picking off women jogging? Or are these simply random acts of evil? No one seems to know. But there's hope that Sherry Papini could still be alive. Her husband has this message for whomever might have kidnapped his wife. Bring her home. Bring her home. Just bring her home. Bring her home safe. There's a $50,000 reward. Bring her home. In all my years of reporting, I've come face to face with my fair share of sexual predators. But today, in a powerful new interview, we meet two very brave victims who were attacked by the same college frat boy. And when you hear how long he'll spend in jail, you'll be outraged. We're teaming up with our affiliate, KSTU, for the story. Here's Pat Lalama. These college students bravely facing the cameras. It was the scariest thing that I've ever been through. Revealing horrifying details about what they suffered at the hands of Sigma Chi frat boy, Jason Willopez. I asked him to stop and he never did. And then, um, sorry. 
Rue Lopez sexually assaulted Morgan Klinkowski at a Utah State University fraternity party. He also raped Victoria Hewlett while doing homework at her apartment. Following the attack, a traumatized Morgan actually cleaned up the evidence. I was scared of him. But there was no way she could scrub away the memory of that terrifying night. Visions that she says haunted her so much, it took her 10 whole months to report the rape to police. In a story Crime Watch Daily first told you about, the details are disgusting. One of the women said she was slapped, choked, and raped multiple times. Another woman says she told him no, not once, not twice, but three times. She says Ro Lopez raped her anyway. This is an extremely serious situation. So who is Jason Ro Lopez? On his hot or not page, he poses bare chested, brandishing his weapon, and says he likes adventurous women who like to have a good time. On his LinkedIn page, Ro Lopez changes his image, portraying a wholesome guy, looking preppy in khakis and a button down shirt. He says he was an air traffic controller and is studying finance. But now his high-flying career has come to a grinding halt. Here's Ro Lopez in court, shackled and wearing a pink jailhouse jumpsuit. Our Salt Lake City affiliate KSTU reporting that Ro Lopez struck a plea deal. One year in jail and admitting he raped the women. His victims are upset that he didn't get a harsher sentence. It was really hard because I definitely don't feel Jason Ray Lopez got what he deserved. Judge Brian Cannell is also angry about the outcome of the case and said in court, if it wasn't for the previously arranged plea agreement, he would have sent Ray Lopez to prison. He calls Ray Lopez's actions repugnant and abhorrible. This is a very private trauma that they have suffered. And so it's very difficult for them to come forward. I was so proud of them. They showed great courage. But the women say not only was it tough facing Ray Lopez in court, they felt they were victimized yet a second time. They say by the defense attorney's brutal pretrial statement. Regret the next day of doing something stupid when you're drunk doesn't make rape and it doesn't make aggravated sexual assault. Victoria Hewlett isn't done seeking justice. She's slapping Utah State University and the Sigma Chi fraternity with a lawsuit, claiming they knew all about Ro Lopez's history but did nothing to stop him. Court documents say before Hewlett was attacked, five other women had reported to the university that they had been sexually assaulted by Ro Lopez. It shouldn't take six of these events. They should be investigated the right way from the first one, not the sixth one. Victoria never returned to Utah State and is now taking classes at Utah Valley University. The girls say with the trial behind them, they are looking forward to moving past this dark chapter in their lives. I was just excited that it was over. Knowing that you truly aren't alone, like the amount of people sorry, who have reached out to me and have like blessed my life because of this struggle. As part of the conditions of the plea deal, Jason Ro Lopez can retake a test that determines the likelihood of reoffense. If he's determined to be low risk, he can be released early from jail. If the results are moderate to high, he would face more prison time. Now we want to hear from you. Do you think one year is too light of a sentence for the suspect? Sound off right now on our Facebook page.